Good morning, brothers and sisters. Good morning. Good morning. Whoa. Good morning, brothers and sisters. All right. <laughs> Thank you so much for an opportunity to bring you a message this morning uh, from an exciting uh, section of Scripture many of us are familiar with. Um, but let me start by just asking the question. How would you describe your relationship with God? What words would you use to describe how he feels about you? Yeah, we just had a nice uh, reflection of that in, that in those beautiful lyrics of that song right now. Would you say that God has a reckless love for you? We're going to take a look at uh, Luke um, 15, where we see Jesus on that very topic God's attitude towards you, how, how that precious love, that unconditional love is pouring out of him that he so wants you as his dear child. And we find this beautifully displayed in three stories that Jesus told back to back, the story of the lost sheep, the lost coin, and the lost son, who some of us know as the story of the prodigal son. And to get all of the, the precious details, uh, the understandings that Jesus would convey, it helps to think a little bit about the original audience that was hearing those stories that day. Luke tells us, uh, we're in chapter 15, verse 1, all the tax collectors and sinners were coming to hear to Jesus to hear him. The tax collectors literally considered traitors to their own country. They worked for that detested Roman government, that army of occupation that was in their land, worked hand in hand with them, and even worse yet, extorted additional money from their countrymen in order to have a lavish uh, lifestyle. Okay, there was no one more vilified in all of Jewish society than the tax collectors. And Luke uses the word sinners, kind of a catch-all phrase for people who were either well-known for a sin or who maintained a sinful lifestyle. This would include uh, such individuals as adulterers, prostitutes, thieves, criminals. Some derogatorily use that word low lives, the low lives of society. And these two groups, the tax collectors, the sinners, were so attracted to this prophet, to this Messiah, who would welcome them, who would even sit down and eat with them. Now, make, make no mistake, Jesus uh, certainly made it plain and clear that their sins condemned them before God. But Jesus had come to be the ransom for their sin and to offer them complete forgiveness. Repent and believe, Jesus constantly urged everyone. Jesus didn't want to lose a single soul, same as it is today. Then in verse 2 we hear, but the Pharisees and the experts of the law, the scribes, were complaining, this man welcomes sinners and eats with them. Again, in that Jewish society, the, the Pharisees considered the, the, the super spiritual people of the day, keeping their hundreds of laws, actually adding literally hundreds more laws, simply so they could uh, demonstrate to people that they kept them. Obviously, a group that depended on their own self-righteousness in order to be saved, rejected, rejected Jesus as the promised one. And by that, that dependence on their self-righteousness, this group, too, was entirely lost. You can easily picture these two groups, probably a little bit of space, maybe a lot of space in between them, the tax collectors, the well-known sinners, and the super spiritual Pharisees and scribes who were scandalized by the way Jesus treated those sinners. And there's Jesus looking out at that group 
of totally lost eternal souls. So it's exciting to think, what kind of a story, a parable, what kind of a teaching could he bring that would reach this entire spectrum of Jewish society? The tax collectors, the sinners, and the super spiritual Pharisees, all of them lost. All of them in his presence. And so we find Jesus telling those three beautiful words, the beautiful stories, lost sheep, lost coin, lost son, that resonate all the way to us today. Absolutely stunning stories that reveal like no other how much God loves you. We begin with um, uh, verse 3 there on the lost sheep. He, Jesus, told them this parable. Which one of you, if you had 100 sheep and lost one of them, would not leave the 99 in the wilderness and go after the one that was lost until he finds it? <laughs> and immediately, <laughs> you would start to think, leave the 99 in the wilderness? How could that be a good idea? And it's interesting because here, as we see also in some of the other parables, Jesus actually kind of stretches reality. Okay, normally you wouldn't have just one shepherd for a hundred sheep, <laughs> but it dramatizes even more what Jesus does. He leaves the 99. Why? Because that one lost sheep, which is you or me, is so precious to Jesus that he leaves the 99 in search of the lost sheep. Now, one of the obvious truths we find here, <laughs> the sheep did not go looking for Jesus. Lost, unable to find its way, it is Jesus, intensely, laser-focused, out to find that sheep. There's a very critical spiritual truth that we find in this. Jesus looking for the lost sheep. The sheep could do nothing to get itself found. Okay, it's the same with our natural spiritual condition. Very important to understand this. There is nothing we can do to save ourselves. And we look at the extremes that God goes to in his word to convince us of our totally lost condition. Consider some of the, the terms that we find in the Bible to, to describe how we are naturally. Naturally, we are lost in darkness. We're lost. We cannot find our way. Objects of God's wrath by nature due to that sinful nature that we've inherited, of course, since Adam and Eve. Paul writes, we are slaves to sin. We can't help ourselves in that natural state. Naturally, the gospel is nonsense to us. We are, as Paul writes, spiritually dead. And the dead can do nothing to raise themselves to spiritual life. We are blind. We cannot see our way. We are lost like sheep. We are children of the devil. He can claim us at the moment of our birth due to that sin before a holy God. We are not just lost in darkness. At one point, Paul says, we are darkness itself. We are by nature deserving of eternal punishment. Jesus went looking for us. Jesus found us. Through the Holy Spirit, working through the word, worked saving faith in our lives, literally raised us from the dead. And why this is so important is that when we acknowledge that our salvation all depends on what God has done for us, we can be 100% sure of our salvation. Through faith, we get credit for Jesus' perfect life as if we'd lived it ourselves. Through faith, we get credit for the punishment 
that Jesus took as if we had done it ourselves. This is that beautiful gospel promise. We go on with Luke in verse 5 where we hear, and when he, Jesus, finds it, the lost sheep, what does he do? He joyfully puts it on his shoulders and goes home. Now imagine we don't, we don't hear this section of Jesus berating the sheep, saying, I hope you've learned your lesson. I hope you shape up and get better. He simply finds the lost sheep, joyfully puts it on his shoulders. It's all about forgiveness and being saved. <laughs> From there, the story gets even better. We've already got Jesus having you on his shoulders having rescued you from yourself. Verse 6, Then Jesus, he calls together his friends and his neighbors, telling them, Rejoice with me, because I have found my lost sheep. What a message. Jesus celebrates having you in his family. Jesus celebrates that he has found you, his lost sheep, unable to do anything for itself, and brought you into his family. Verse 7, Jesus says to that crowd in front of him, I tell you, in the same way, there will be more joy in heaven over one sinner who repents than over 99 righteous people who do not need to repent. Wow. You think of that crowd at this point, the, the tax collectors and the sinners, <laughs> they are really getting into this, identifying so much with being so, so lost. The other group, wow, pointedly <laughs> taken care of here. Jesus says the 99 who do not feel they need to repent. Without repentance, there can be no forgiveness and salvation. Verse 8, verse eight we go on. Second story. Or what woman who has ten silver coins, if she loses one coin, would not light a lamp, sweep the house, and search carefully until she finds it? Probably an audible gasp from the crowd at this moment. Jesus has just plainly compared God to a woman. A woman. Again, the gasp from the, from the sinners to the Pharisees, why would Jesus compare Almighty God to a woman? In one sense, it's certainly very exclusionary, inclusionary, inclusionary. Um, the, the, the main character in the first story was a male, Second story, main character is a female. And as I read that verse, I, I couldn't help but think of my, my, my dear mother. Can you recall a time uh, in the basement watching NFL football with, with, my, with my dad or down the basement? Mom had her, her little sewing machine and her table off to the side, sewing away, and all of a sudden discovered she had lost her precious sewing scissors. Dad and I actually bolted out of the basement as mom turned first the basement, then the entire house over to find those sewing scissors. Probably enough said on that. <laughs> okay, but again, we get that, that picture of that, that woman sweeping her whole house until she finds her coin, and then that beautiful verse 9, once again, Jesus, back to that extraordinary uh, scene, verse 9, and when she finds it, she calls together her friends and neighbors and says, rejoice with me because I have found the lost coin. And once again, that original audience. And once again, you and I, for the second time, Jesus intently, emphatically reminding us of the joy that God feels over having you as his dear child. Just think about it. 
God, it brings God joy that you are in his family. Jesus goes on in verse 10, in the same way, in the same way, I tell you, there is joy in the presence of the angels of God over one sinner who repents. It's hard. It's hard to almost wrap your head around that. As you come to faith, whether in baptism or through the word, as you continue as God's dear, dear child, the angels rejoice. The angels that one day we will be side by side at the eternal banquet. Make no mistake, though, those final words, joy in the presence of angels over those who repent. I remember in the missionary work that Mary and I have done from, from the Amazon jungle, you know, through South America, Asia, Africa, uh, so many places, a lot of times in, in small villages, and the number of times that we go in with that solid, you know, law and gospel message, repent, forgiveness is available through Jesus Christ, eternal souls are at stake, and how often people who had listened to our message, how often, how many would come up, I can, it, it is, they would actually kind of pat me on the back and say, thank you for your message. Okay, if we'd been going to the village a lot, they'd say the kids are better behaved since you started coming. But don't, don't worry about that being lost. Don't worry about that. The only people who deserve eternal punishment, assassinos, <laughs> murderers, um, child traffickers, they'll go there. I'm not perfect, but I don't merit eternal punishment. And so we see Jesus teaching so clearly, pleadingly, repentance. Acknowledge your sin, and forgiveness is immediately available. No matter what your sin, you can be forgiven, and eternal life is your future. We go on. One more story, the lost son. We won't spend quite as much time on, on the lost son since it's so well known, but again, just pick out some of these beautiful, precious details. Every single word of the lost son, it's just, it's such a, a treasure for us. Some have called it the greatest short story um, ever told. The, the, the drama, the teachings, truly extraordinary. Let's bring out just a little bit more of the intensity that we find in some of these details. The lost son starts with Jesus saying in verse 11, Jesus said, a certain man had two sons. The younger of them said to his, fa to his father, Father, give me my share of the estate. So he divided his property between them. Once again, I'm thinking audible gasps in the crowd for that younger son to ask for his inheritance was equivalent to him saying, Dad, I wish you were dead. And just as startling to the crowd is the father's reaction, that he simply does, in fact, divide the inheritance at that moment and the uh, younger son takes off. <clears throat> we know the story. We're told that he goes to a distant land. There he squanders his money on riotous living. Don't get too many details, but we know soon the money's gone, the friends are gone. And again, the, the high drama, the intensity of uh, Jesus' tale, the fact that, he, that the young son hires himself to a Gentile, to watch their pigs, doubly bad, working for the Gentiles, working with these unclean animals. It simply could not get worse. 
in the eyes of that Jewish society. <laughs> but in fact, it does get worse. Jesus even takes it to another level. Apparently, his pay wasn't sufficient uh, to even cover some food. So we see the sun hit absolute, unequivocal rock bottom in that he has to push the pigs aside trying to get at the pig food, the scraps of garbage to try and fill his stomach. Verse 17, when he, the lost son, came to his senses, he said, how many of my father's hired servants have more than enough bread and I am dying from hunger? I will get up, go to my father, and tell him, Father, I have sinned against heaven and in your sight. I am no longer worthy to be called your son. Make me like one of your hired servants. And again, exquisite storytelling, these truths that, that, that come out. The fact is, the way Jesus tells the story, we don't know how much the son actually <laughs> is sorry for what he did and how much of it is driven <laughs> by this fact that he's starving to death. Okay, we can certainly sense in his words that there is some true repentance in there. But again, Jesus purposely leaves it rather ambiguous. True repentance but really driven by this need uh, to, to, to get some food. We see what happens, verse 7. He, the younger son, got up and went to his father. While he was still far away, his father saw him and was filled with compassion. He ran. <laughs> A lot of gasps in that audience during these stories. Here would be another one. It was unthinkable that a sophisticated, dignified, well-to-do elderly man in his flowing robes would have never been seen breaking into a run, much less running towards that son whose last words were, Dad, I wish you were dead, in so many words, the meaning of what, what it meant for him to leave. The father is running to that wayward son. He, the father, hugged his son and kissed him. Verse 21, the son said to him, Father, he starts up, he's, he's, got that, he's got that confession, he's already rehearsed it, we know what he's supposed to say. The son said, Father, I have sinned against heaven in your sight. I am no longer worthy to be called your son. And right here, <laughs> fascinatingly enough, we find Bible commentators with... with <laughs> two very different opinions on, on what's, what happens right at this moment. Again, Jesus has exquisitely already told us what this big whole confession is supposed to be. He's supposed to have that line about, you know, make me your servant and, and all that, and we don't get that. What happened? Some Bible experts say he felt such deep repentance at this moment that he didn't even, don't even care about the servant part. I am so sorry for what I've done. Makes complete sense. Other Bible experts, and I'm a little inclined to this side because it's just more exciting. <laughs> other, other Bible experts will say, actually, the father simply cuts him off in mid-confession. He's saying, I am no longer worthy to be called your son. Yeah, the father, good enough. We can stop right there. We'll stop right there. You are so forgiven for the sake of my son. And immediately, immediately, the father says, quick, Bring out the best robe, put it on him. Put a ring on his finger and sandals on his feet. Bring the fattened calf and kill it. Let us eat and celebrate. Be 
Because this son of mine was dead. He's alive again. He was lost and is found. That's how God feels about you. That is an absolute description of how joyous God is to have you in his family. The white robe, the ring, the sandals, absolutely no evidence of the boy's sinful past. Absolutely covered, canceled out. We think of those very, very same type of words that, that Paul wrote to Galatians, to the Galatians, he writes to you and I. Indeed, as many of you as were baptized into Christ have been clothed with Christ. Oh, you will not find three more precious words in your entire earthly life than to know you are clothed with Christ. You get credit for Jesus' perfect life as if you had lived it yourself. That's what God's talking about. I suspect some of us have probably walked in the, the church doors this morning still carrying some guilt from something in the past. Maybe something recent, maybe within weeks or months. Maybe guilt for something that happened decades ago. This story's for you. Talked to a Christian psychologist just a few weeks ago, <laughs> and she was saying, she goes, you know, from her experience, then there's research, on, she goes, most people have made anywhere from four to six really, really bad, often sinful decisions in their life that have had real repercussions that have resonated in their being over the years. What God is telling us today, what he is speaking directly to you and putting a white robe on you. You see that ring? You are my son or daughter. Sandals? <laughs> Holy feet. You walk through this life clothed, should be basking in the holiness that God is gifting you with because of what Jesus has done for us. Jesus goes one step further. We've heard the shepherd who rejoiced, called together his, 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 his neighbors. We've heard of the woman, called together her friends and neighbors. Party time. I found the lost. <laughs> in, in the lost son, the fatted calf, the celebration, the whole, the whole, the whole house <laughs> becomes one large party. We are told there is dancing. <laughs> Imagine it. Jesus is saying it's as, as if God dances for joy. Let that sink in. God dances for joy. It's as if the whole palace turned into a boombox <laughs> and is just that excited, that joyful that you are part of his family. The final words that Jesus says as, as he finishes his story there, and we're going to need to stop there, we'll, we'll cover the lost son, the um, older son, in a, in a future message. But again, by now, those sinners, tax collectors, I suspect well nigh ecstatic at the clear invitation to join Jesus 
to believe in him and accept as a gift that complete forgiveness. And once again, if you walked in those doors today still carrying any guilt, Jesus invites you, leave it here. Leave it at the cross. Carry that picture emblazoned on your heart. You walk around each day of your life with God seeing you in that white robe of righteousness that Jesus won for you. How many times, how many ways does, does, does God try to tell you to let go of your guilt? Man, <laughs> you know, the, the, the language gets a little extreme. As far as the east is from the west, it is that far gone. Though it was crimson, white as snow, what do we not get here? Your guilt drowned in the depths of the sea. No one's going to get it. It's gone. It is so gone. Jesus took care of all of it. Any guilt you may still have when you walk out today, my prayer is that you leave it here. In the clearest terms possible, God says to us, I will remember your sins no more. Beautiful, clear, clear words. Let's conclude today uh, we, with a little paraphrase of those, those words that um, the father spoke to the older son. Let's say those together. Very good. All together. I was lost, but Jesus found me. I was dead, but Jesus raised me to life. The eternal heavenly feast awaits me. All this for Jesus' sake. Let's bow our heads in prayer. <clears throat> heavenly Father, these images are almost too beautiful for us. They so clearly show us how you feel about us. How you, in your perfect holiness, found a way to take us lost, slaced us in, lost in darkness, darkness itself, you were able to find a way to bring us into your family, and that way is Jesus. We could do nothing to find ourselves. You intensely came after us. You pursued us. And through the power of the Holy Spirit, brought us into your family. Give us the power, give us the sense of urgency to bring that saving story to all those we know that still need to have Jesus in their hearts. All this we pray in Jesus' precious name. Amen.